the people are just joining now. Hi, everyone, if you're just joining. <clears throat> we'll give it a couple more minutes uh, just to allow people to arrive. Good morning. Good afternoon, good evening. Cool. So I'm going to start to introduce the webinar and soon hand it over to our guests. So thanks everyone for joining us this evening uh, or maybe this morning, wherever you are in the world. So welcome to episode nine of the ECOT program webinars. And today we are going to be in Hawaii with Astrid Delorme from Storage Project, which is an endorsed project of the Early Career Ocean Professionals program. And for those of you that are new or not so aware of the ECOT program, I thought I'd just introduce it really briefly. So we are part of the the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. We're one of the, the project, the programs that were endorsed very early on at the start of the decade in 2021. And an ECOP is anyone who self-identifies as being early in their career, who's working towards a sustainable and healthy ocean. And our mission is to really incorporate new ways of thinking into global ocean sustainability. And we do this by empowering ECOPs with meaningful network and professional development opportunities. So part of these webinars are to really strengthen our network and to allow resources from within our network to be broadcast to everyone else. Um, and so some of the things that are happening within the ECOP program are the national and regional nodes that we have set up in various different countries and regions. Um, you can go to our website and you can see if there is a national or regional hub or node that relates to where you are. And if not, you can always get in touch with us and talk about starting your own. And these are just run by ECOPs on the ground who may be studying or working in that place. And there's a real need for people to get together and strengthen um, in a network that is in a lot more of a, a local way. So we also have four task teams and they're working on, in more of a thematic areas across ocean literacy, training and mentoring, DEI and Ocean Bridges, which is bridging this gap between intergenerational diversity and knowledge sharing between early career and sort of more established professionals in ocean science. And then finally, we've got the endorsed program project, sorry. So this is Ocean Decade Actions that come underneath the, the ECOP program and storage is one of them. So we've got eight at the moment. There's a call out for you to submit your actions to the Ocean Decade. And I think the deadline is the 31st of August. So this is coming up quickly, but there'll be another call announced in October, I think. And so some of the resources that we have with the ECOP program, as I mentioned, we have webinars. So this is number uh, nine of our webinar series. We also have a monthly newsletter. We have several campaigns and articles. We share jobs, opportunities, and we also have meetup uh, opportunities at different events. So this is a photo from the ECOP group at the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon last year. And so here's some of the, the ways that you can get in touch with us on social media. Probably the easiest thing is to sign up to the newsletter, which is on the front page of the, the Ocean uh, of the ECOP Decade website. So. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Astrid and um, 
hopefully she is going to take over. So Ashley, you can if you can introduce yourself and um you will also be into moderating for the webinar and introducing the um the other speakers, Katie and Brittany. And if anyone has any questions that come up throughout the webinar, you can I can be on the Q&A and I can be in the chat, but there's going to be time for questions at the end, just to mention that. So over to you, Ashton. Thank you. And yeah, thank you for inviting me and um, Brittany and Katie to speak at the webinars. Um, so yes, yeah, so we'll, um, we're three researchers here based on here in Hawaii, and we're all working on different projects, uh, all um, looking into the plastic pollution here on Hawaii and um, more in the Pacific. Um, so I'll be um, in talking about my project storage, which is a ECUP endorsed uh, project. And then we have Katie Stevens, uh, who will talk about her projects at the Center of Marine Debris Research Center here. Um, and then uh, we have Brittany Lockett, who will talk about her uh, master thesis project that she also do, um, is doing here at the Center of Marine Debris Research. Um, so uh, yeah, so I'll, and we all are at our different stages in our career and we all had different routes uh, and how we ended up here. And seeing that this is an early career and professional webinar, we thought that we could give a little background of like how we ended up here, um, just to show that everyone's path is different and uh, maybe give some inspiration and uh, yeah. So uh, I'll be talking about storage, but um, just to give a little introduction to like my career background. So I, I think most of you know um, that the career path is never a straight line. It's very, um, there's different loops and you have different experiences and then eventually you end up where, where you are. That was definitely my case. So I'm half French, half Swedish. So I'm coming um, from Europe. And then I did my master's and bachelor's at the University of Nottingham um, studying chemistry. And that also included one year in Australia, uh, also studying chemistry, um, which was a really nice experience. And then I stayed at the University of Nottingham to pursue my PhD, um, which uh, was a really, um, it was for a new uh, PhD program. So it was a four year program instead of a three year or three and a half years in England, um, which allowed me to design my own um, PhD project, uh, which just had to, so we got um, a lot of freedom, but it just had to be within green and sustainable chemistry. We got to do courses and um, classes on um, sustainability business and learn how learn the, the 12 principles of green chemistry and so on. Uh, so that was nice. And my PhD um, project was on making a reaction greener or more sustainable by using electrochemistry. And uh, it also allowed this PhD program also allowed me to uh, complete a internship and in anything that I wanted. It didn't need to be related to my PhD project. And it just had to be, again, within this green and sustainable and environmental field. So I got an internship at the UN Environment Program. Uh, Their headquarters in Nairobi, in Kenya, uh, where I actually worked on a project for uh, improving the climate information in Pacific Islands. So it's pretty close to where I am now. So that's really, that's really fun actually. Um, and that was also a very nice experience uh, professionally and also um, for me culturally and seeing another country and also seeing different problems in that part of the world as well as um, the projects I was working on. So I saw a lot of the plastic pollution problem there because it's a waste management. Um, uh, situation wasn't great at the at the moment there, um, and also working at the UN environment, I got to see like these big big problems, and uh, that really motivated me to stay uh, to try and get a project more in this uh, plastic pollution problem. Um, so after my PhD in England, I uh, moved back to France, and I did I worked on a um, European project as a postdoc called Terminus. And um, this project was on um, 
recycling our food packaging. So at the moment, we can't recycle any of our food packaging and Terminus um, aimed to develop a new system where you could actually um, make a new type of food packaging, which can be recycled. And then I did another postdoc at Campo uh, working on a sea life project, another European project, um, which was on developing biodegradable and bio-based um, plastics um, for different types of applications. And this project was really nice because it involved everyone in the life cycle of a plastic, uh, also including waste management of different biodegradable um, and bio-based plastics to ensure that it's really, um, biodegradable for the different applications. And during my uh, two postdocs in France, uh, I uh, also was thinking about the future and that I want to stay in research, but I want to um, lead my own project and be an independent researcher. So there is this opportunity in Europe called the Marie Curie Fellowship, um, which allows uh, postdocs to make their own projects in any field and uh, it gives you a lot of freedom. You can work with a lot of different people. So um, I started, I wanted to stay in the plastic pollution field. I wanted to understand the problem in the environment and specifically in the ocean. And I uh, started looking at, um, reaching out to people that I would want to work with, the organizations that I want to work with. So I emailed a lot of people. And I ended up getting in contact with the Ocean Cleanup, which is an NGO based in the Netherlands uh, that are looking at different solutions for cleaning up uh, the plastics in the, in the oceans by developing systems to clean up in the big garbage patches or even in rivers now. So the Ocean Cleanup put me in contact with Sarah Jean, uh, Sarah Jean Royer, uh, who's an ocean plastic researcher. Uh, based in Hawaii, so she works for the Ocean Cleanup, but also with Hawaii Pacific University. So we started talking about different possible projects and what we could do for a marine project. And then I also started talking more with uh, the French Institute here or in France, um, such as Clermont-Vernier-P and Yves which is sort of the, the French NOAA. And then we developed the project storage, which got funded in 2022. So that was very exciting. So um, now more on storage, uh, the whole motivation uh, or research question that drove um, the making of storage is that there's a lot of um, models on plastic pollution in the ocean uh, that predict that a lot of the plastic released from land is stranded or settled by the uh, worst shoreline. So you can, and some models predict even that two thirds of the, the plastics released from, from land is actually stranded on the shorelines. So it's a significant amount. And here you can see Hawaii, uh, which has um, a high concentration of plastic, um, mainly because of its position in um, the Pacific, which I'll get into soon. And um, so there's a, even though, so we know the, because environments are storing a lot of plastics, but there's still a lot of questions um, on how it's being stored and how much is being stored. So when we're doing um, uh, surveying of plastics on the beaches, uh, we often look at just the surface um, surface plastic and not uh, in the depth. So um, we need to figure out if uh, if this surface layer of the plastic is that a representative amount of how much plastic is actually on these beaches um, or is there more underneath the surface and in Hawaii there's never been a study or public study um, that looks at um, plastic under 10 centimeters of sand and there's only been a handful of studies in the whole world uh, looking at the depth um, distribution of plastics and uh, on beaches and then um, it would be interesting to see what sort of um, plastics are beached on these um, beaches and also in the sand column. Are they small sizes? Are they fragments? Um, and just getting a better understanding on um, what type of plastic we have. So, uh, and all like we want to understand the fate of the beach plastic because it would, is such a 
um, predicted big sink of plastic. Um, that is really important to understand how they're being, how the plastic is being stored. Is it just being stored, or is it being re-released in the ocean? Is it how is it being degraded on the on the beaches? Because beaches are um, very interesting to study as well for the degradation um, of plastic. Um, and uh, yeah, seeing just getting a um, an understanding of the fate of beach plastic. So that's uh, the main driving force of storage, um, which is actually stands for it's not it's a very long acronym, but uh, um, it's predicting the fate of plastics on the beaches by their three D distribution and weathering processes. Um, so in our project, we have three objectives. So the first one is to really understand the, the quantity of plastics on the on um, the whole um, like three D distribution of plastic. Um, so we're looking at um, the surface layer, which we um, uh, decide to be two centimeters of the top layer. And then we look at every layer, 10 centimeters layers uh, down to one meter. And for each beach that we're doing our field surveys, um, we have three holes uh, or quadrants that we call them um, to get the errors and standard deviation and the median um, and so on. And, uh, so this is what I'm doing in Hawaii. I'm doing the field surveys, collecting um, plastic concentrations uh, and on the beach uh, in the sand column. And I do it every three months um, to get the seasonality effect and um, the weathering impacts and so on. Then our second objective is to investigate the plastic degradation phase of a weathering. So on beaches, um, the degradation is, is uh, expected to be uh, quite fast because it's um, there's usually little shade on beaches and there's a heat buildup on the sand, uh, which so with the solar radiation, the heat, um, the it favors degradation of plastics. And when you have degradation of plastic, it usually makes the plastic brittle. And then you have the brittle material in an environment such as beaches where there's sand movement and, and wave movement in the swash zone, um, which can easily break uh, fragile materials into smaller pieces. So, and we want to avoid the breaking down of bigger pieces of plastics into smaller pieces of plastic because it makes the cleanup a lot harder and also you increase the bioavailability of plastics um, and when they become smaller in size. Um, so yeah, to, under to try and understand this um, degradation rate or brittleness, like how fast it becomes brittle, uh, we are exposing um, plastic materials out in the environment and, and then taking periodically samples to uh, conduct lab analysis on the, the weather samples. And our objective three is to use the, the field survey data and the degradation uh, data to uh, try and model uh, the fate of plastics on beaches um, to really try and understand like, how long it's being stored, how is it being stored on the, um, on the beach and uh, how, yeah, is it being degraded and so on. And then use this data to um, correlate it with ocean plastic and seeing and really the plastic from beaches and into the into the ocean. So our study sites are in Hawaii, and we Hawaii is a very um, uh, the perfect place to study this really because it's uh, the fate of plastic because it's so close to the North Pacific Garbage Patch, so or also called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is a, a had um, a place in the Pacific Ocean where because of currents and the gyres, um, they accumulate a high amount of plastics. Um, so this patches between California and Hawaii and Hawaii is believed to receive a lot of plastic from this patch. Um, and my study sites are on the east side of Oahu, which are all facing the north of um, so I use these three beaches and I go um, every three months to sample the um, the plastic in the sand column. So what we do every three months is I use these carpet metal frame boxes, um, which are 60 times 60 centimeters, and 
we collect the sand in box, in these buckets, or into buckets, uh, for each layer. And then for each layer, we add it to this machine called the buoyancy separating device, which was made here on this island um, by Seed.World. And uh, we, it's basically a wheelbarrow, but you add the sand and then you add water. Uh, you stir um, the sand and the water around, and it makes the natural and the floating. And the natural and the plastic debris float to the surface, and then you scoop it up into uh, the mesh bag that's at the end of the wheelbarrow here. And then um, you do that for each layer. So I have 11 layers to surface layer, and then the, the column layers, um, every 10 centimeter layers down to one meter. And then we bring the bags uh, back to the lab, we dry them, and we see through any sun that's going through. We weigh the natural and the plastic debris, and uh, we then separate the natural debris that we collected from the plastic debris. We then lay out um, the plastic uh, on the a, a blue mat. And so this is just an example of what I, I got for one of the beaches at one meter depth. And it's just, just plastic. And we take a picture of this. And then we can run a segmentation model. Um, it's a computer model that was developed by the Ocean Cleanup. And uh, it's, uh, this model can count the amount of plastic from the picture I took. Uh, it can also give me the size of the different uh, plastic particles. And it also gives me the category of the different plastic particles, like for example, or the classes of, of plastic. So for example, this one is identified as a line and the, these blue ones are all like, fragments. Um, so this saves me a lot of time and it's, uh, yeah, it gives me a lot of data as well. On the plastic. And then we do further analysis um, because I have too many plastic particles, unfortunately, uh, for all of my layers. Um, we randomly select um, a few of the particles uh, to um, conduct an infrared analysis, uh, which is a analysis that can give me, um, that can help me identify the, the type of polymer uh, that the plastic is composed of. So um, at the moment, I, we've done four field surveys and I have a lot of data, which I'm still processing and I'm one year into this project. Um, but just to give you a glimpse of the data that we have so far, uh, so these are the results from November. Um, we did find plastics all the way down to one meter. So it's suggesting that it's not just at the surface and that plastic is being transferred down to um, the depth, like at deeper levels on the beach um, by some process that we need to figure out. And then there's a general trend of uh, decrease in plastic concentration with depth. Um, but occasionally, or like quite often, we do see a, a bump or um, a peak at 60 and 70 centimeters, which is really interesting, um, which I also need to uh, figure out why. Um, and so, for example, at Laia, we got almost 10,000 particles in total in all three holes. Uh, we're only 7% at the surface. And then at White Manalo Beach, uh, we got uh, less particles, but also 50% just at the surface. So this in any case, the plastic is not just at the surface, and we're um, if we're using the data from beach field surveys, we're missing a lot of data from the depth. So um, it shows the importance of this data. And we have, um, from our repetitive field surveys, we've seen similar numbers, at, like the percentage of what is at the surface. The plastic concentration changes a lot between the three months, but um, yeah, not a lot at the surface. By James Campbell, we get most of the times just at the plastic at the surface. So about 50% is at the, the surface or the first few layers of sand, uh, which is really interesting. And it's suggesting that different beaches will store different amount of plastics and they have, they favor less the transfer of plastics on the sand column. So um, yeah, it's really interesting for me to look at all of this and try and understand this. Uh, we also um, see that most of our plastics are fragments and they're between 1.5 and 0 0.15 centimeters. So um, suggesting that the plastic either arriving or while, while they're being stored on the beach, they're very brittle and they break into small pieces. 
And most of our plastics are polyethylene um, and polypropylene. So you can see the, the black and the red uh, parts there. And at James Campbell, because we had less plastic there, there's more vari variability as we go down the column. Um, so why is this data important? Um, it's so as we this data can help us understand where we should do the beach stream up, where are the hotspots and like for example if say James Campbell we see at, that the most of the plastics are at the surface then maybe the beach cleanups would be better to just focus on on those sort of beaches where it's just at the surface and then we need to figure out this transportation of plastics further down like south or or whatever so it gives us uh, an idea where the hot like where we should do beach cleanups and also what sort of technologies we should use for the different beaches. So we're seeing um, maybe if it's at the surface, it's easier for just um, people doing beach cleanups. Whereas if it's at the depth, then we need to rethink the type of cleanup technologies that we need. And also um, uh, it could, if once we have the data into these models, can it also help us understand whether uh, more upstream solutions, such as cleaning up the ocean uh, before it's reaching to the beaches, is that gonna uh, help the type, like stop the type of plastic coming into uh, onto the beaches? Because it might be easier to clean bigger pieces of plastic and those garbage patches where it concentrates rather than the uh, small, uh, fragments that we're seeing in our sand columns, uh, which might also be re-released into the ocean as microplastics, and it's really difficult to clean up. Um, and then also, uh, we want this data to be uh, to be used for scientific evidence uh, once decision and policy making is being done, uh, which is really important at this moment because um, the UN Treaty on Plastic Pollution is being developed. I think it was yeah, it was accepted last year or 2022 even, I think, um, so that we can really have scientific evidence for all the decisions being made. Like for example, if we need to enforce a beach cleanup at what frequency and where, and also um, develop mitigation actions um, so that it's not even ending up in our beaches. Um, sorry about the loud door. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear it. Um, so yeah, so it's great to have um, to be part of this UN Ocean Decade because I'm um, being I'm in this group where it is stakeholders from all sorts of fields um, all over the world, and I'm being put in contact with people that could use my data or I can use their knowledge and data uh, into my project. So I've been, yeah, I've had quite a lot of really nice conversations and opportunities through being part of this project. So this is great. And so, yeah, at the end, um, towards the end now, and I'd just like to thank European Union for funding this project and the UN Ocean Decade for endorsing this project. Um, and I'd like to thank the, the team that I work with. So the Ocean the Ocean Cleanup Research Team, uh, the CMDR, and my French Institute, Les Primaires and Clermont Garnier and Pitt. And then I need to thank all the volunteers that have helped me getting all the data and my goals essentially, uh, because I would not have been able to get all this data without them. A lot of hard work. And yeah, mahalo for listening. And, uh, I think we'll keep the questions for everyone at the end. And I'll hand it over to Brittany. Thanks, Astrid. Thank you, Astrid. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Yes. Brittany, looking okay. good. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, so I am Brittany, um, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about my master's thesis, just a section on it um, for the sake of time. But um, today I'll, I'll be focusing on the section of quantifying microplastics in a fine scale convergence phenomenon 
around Mackay Pier, Windward, Oahu. And first, I'll talk a little bit about my education and career pathway thus far. So I completed my undergraduate degree at California State University, Monterey Bay. I got my degree in marine science. And while I was there, I also studied a semester um, at the University of Sunshine Coast in Australia. And then I graduated in May of 2020. So employment opportunities due to COVID were lacking. Um, so I ended up moving up to the North Coast of California, where I began volunteering at the North Coast Marine Mammal Center. And during that time, I was also researching graduate programs. Um, I wanted to stick to the marine science um, field. And I came into contact with my current advisor, David Field. And then I also ended up completing um, an internship at that same North Coast Marine Mammal Center, where I helped with the rescue, rehabilitation, and release of marine mammals, such as harbor seals and northern elephant seals. And then once I got to HPU and started my graduate degree, I started studying this convergence phenomenon at Mackay Pier. And last summer, I also completed an internship at Hawaii Marine Animal Response, where we surveyed offshore islands for green sea turtle nests. So what is convergence? This is a pretty big part of my thesis in understanding why things concentrate to begin with. And generally it's different water masses interacting with each other and or surface water sinking beneath each other, which will create a manifestation of floating things at the surface. So anything that floats will also converge at the surface. This schematic by Govidal 2019 is a really great visual for how things concentrate in these areas. So things such as plankton, plastics, um, will concentrate, which also attract things like fish and birds. And then the photo on top is a photo that I took at Mackay Pier of um, a similar smaller scale of a convergence feature that I saw that's mostly just bubbles, but there are some microplastics in there. So like Astrid talked about, the Hawaiian islands are very close to the Great Pacific Garbage Patch geographically. And this figure is a modification of a figure from Laudal 2014, in which they recorded different densities of microplastics within the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And they found an average of around 0.5 pieces per square meter, with 10 being the highest observed, 10 pieces per square meter. And those are all represented by the pink circles in that box. And even around the Hawaiian Islands, there are um, some higher densities. And we, like Astrid also talked about, we think that uh, microplastics from this patch come to the windward shores of the Hawaiian Islands because of the Northeast trade winds. So my environmental setting for my thesis is Mackay Pier, which is on the Southeast corner of Oahu, meaning that it is exposed to the Northeast trade winds. So we see a lot of microplastics and different convergence features. And we think that the wind and waves over the shallow reef drive in a longshore flow to the study site, which is what brings debris to the area. And unpublished data from an undergraduate at Hawaii Pacific University um, recorded subsurface currents at the site in the southeast direction at 10 centimeters per second. However, we think that surface currents act much differently due to strong winds acting on the surface and also based off of what we've observed with the convergence features themselves. And this is a bathymetric map of the area around the study site. So there's a pretty stark change in depth with the reef and um, the stretched area on the right. So the red area is around zero to five feet in depth, and then the green area is between 15, 20 and greater. And this may be aiding in the transformation of surface flow to a faster subsurface flow, which would create potentially a convergence um, of surface waters. Additionally, um, an aspect of Mackay Pier is a swash zone, which is basically the area adjacent to shore that continuously deposits and resuspends debris, which might be its own concentrated feature in and of itself away from the other concentrated features that we see farther offshore. And my research objectives that I'll be talking about today 
um, is to estimate a range of densities of microplastics between different environmental conditions and to determine which condition, if any, is the most influential to the highest densities of microplastics. So the four environmental conditions that I'm investigating are above average north swell, above average wind speed, average wind speed, and below average wind speed. And my quantitative survey days are based off of these four environmental parameters and they're targeted for these parameters. And my goal is to survey on four days each environmental condition, giving a total of 16 days. And so far I have 13, I just need one more above average north swell, or sorry, above average wind speed, um, one more average wind speed and one more below average wind speed. And today I'll actually be sampling with Astrid and Sarah Jean to um, for the average wind speed day, but it might actually turn into an above average wind speed day. So the survey days will start with a semi-quantitative survey, which is basically just to identify any areas with higher concentrations of debris and if there's any distinct features in any zones around the pier and also to establish zones that are farther away from the features, which we consider the background zones or what might be contributing to the concentration of debris in the features. And we conduct three new stinettos behind a paddleboard. And the first one of those is going to be in the background zone or away from any concentrated feature. And the second one is through the swash zone, which is that distinct concentrating mechanism right along shore. And then the last one is through the most concentrated feature. And then between each of these net toes, we take it back to the beach and rinse it down, empty the sample into a sample container and then start the next toe. And opportunistically, we also collect sieve samples through the surface of the water if there's a really highly, um, higher than normal concentrated feature, um, specifically with microplastics inside. And when we do collect sieve samples, we collect two from the center of the feature and two from the perimeter of the feature to get some variation of densities within that feature. Once I have my samples, I take them back to the lab and for any feature or any sample that's really concentrated and that would take far too long to go through and pick out the microplastics, I use a plankton splitter to split the sample until around 100 to 200 pieces remain. And then all other samples, including that split sample, is sieved into two different size classes, 250 to 500 microns and greater than 500 microns. And those 500 micron or greater than 500 micron samples are the only ones that I am currently quantifying. So I dry and weigh all of those samples and similar to Astrid, I use a segmentation model by the ocean cleanup to obtain size data and the count of particles per sample so that I can calculate density. And then for my highly concentrated samples, such as the feature net toe samples, I take the largest 20 and the smallest 20 pieces and I analyze them in the ATR FDIR for polymer identification. So these are some of the results from the background zones and each day of surveys is on the x-axis and then the microplastic density is on the y-axis and it's an, on a log scale. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, the background samples are represented by plus signs and each environmental parameter represents a different color. So blue is north swell, green is light wind, um, orange is average wind and purple is above average wind. And then that yellow horizontal line represents the average density recorded in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch that I showed earlier with that Law at All 2014 figure. And then the red line represents the highest density recorded in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And these background densities are all ranging around 0.1 pieces per square meter, which was actually also a pretty common um, density that was found in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And there's also very little variability between environmental conditions. So there, there's not much um, changing in the background zones. Now for the swash zone densities, these ones are represented by the open triangles and there's much more variation between days and also between environmental conditions. They range within around two orders of magnitude. 
And some of these densities are even comparable to the highest density recorded in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, while most kind of stick around the average density recorded. And for the feature samples, the um, solid squares represent the sieve samples taken from the center of the features. The solid triangles represent the samples taken from the net toe through the feature. And then the squares with the cross are um, the sieve samples from the perimeter of the features. And some of these densities are almost as high as 10,000 pieces per square meter. Those were on um, an above average wind day, and those are almost three orders of magnitude greater than the highest density recorded in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch from that Law at All 2014 paper. And there's also consistently higher densities under Norswell conditions, as you can see, and they're, they're all pretty high on Norswell conditions. Um, comparing to the above, above average wind conditions, there's two days where they're very high and one that's kind of um, around the same densities as Norswell conditions. And there's also consistently lower densities under light wind conditions. And you might notice that some of these light wind days don't even have a feature toe, and that's because there weren't any features present. There's hardly any microplastics, um, not enough to really determine any distinct convergence feature. So these pictures are just to show what these densities actually look like at the study site. So on May 12th, that was a light wind day where we recorded around 0.85 pieces per square meter. And you won't really see anything that'll stick out. You might um, see a piece here and there when you're paddling around, but it's not a distinct feature like um, in the next two photos. So in the next one, that was an above average wind day, which yielded a density of around 180 pieces per square meter and higher. And that's what that feature kind of looked like. And, it's mostly that brown stuff is all algae, but if you were to take a closer look, there's a lot of pieces of microplastics stuck inside the algae and also floating between the pieces of algae. But it is harder to see from afar and you don't really see the plastics until you get close. And then the next photo on another above average wind day, the density, one of the densities recorded in that patch was 4,300 pieces per square meter. And this one, you can see a lot of the microplastics. So a lot of those white pieces are plastics and um, looking even closer, you can see a lot more. But that density is over 400 times greater than the highest density recorded in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So why might these two environmental conditions concentrate more microplastics and features at Mackay Pier. Strong winds might be acting on the surface water so strongly that it just keeps debris retained inside the study site. Um, that jetty might also be helping from um, keeping debris from leaving. And then under North Soil conditions, we think that a larger volume of water is aimed down the coast, which in turn would um, cause more water to flow through the, stud the study site and get potential for more debris to pass through the study site and become retained. So my next steps are to investigate how wind direction, among other parameters that I am recording, influence the different densities of debris and also finish collecting my samples. So I have three more field days left, including today. And then um, not in the scope of my research, but hopefully Hopefully further down the line, someone can study the physical mechanisms behind the accumulation of debris. So what's actually causing the convergence? Right now we can just speculate, but we don't actually know if there's differences in densities of water masses creating the convergence or if there's just differences in current directions. So that still needs to be understood. And then um, I'll be defending my thesis and hopefully graduating in December. And now I will pass it off to Katie. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, yes. Good. <laughs> okay, and yes, we can hear you. Screen works. We might need a bit more volume though, Katie, for you, just to hear you a bit better. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> That's okay. You just have to speak up. <laughs> okay. 
Do you see anything? <laughs> Do you want me to share your pre presentation from my screen? Um, let me see. Just while we're waiting, if you have any you have questions, any questions for, for Brittany, Brittany or Astrid, Astrid that have come up, up then just pop them in the Q&A and we'll try and, we'll try and have try a, a discussion, discussion and get those investments at the end. At the end. Shall I share, Shall I your, share your presentation, presentation. Katie? Katie. Oh, oh, lost your sound. Lost your sound. Can you not hear can me not anymore? Hear anymore? No, we, no, we can hear you now. Can hear now. Okay, I don't know okay, what I happened know what with my computer. computer. If you could if share, you could my, share presentation, my presentation, that would be great. Okay, okay. And we just need and to have one, have one sound, sound. Uh, because at the moment we, the have moment we have two of you. Two of you. So there's a bit of a, a, bit of a echo. echo. <laughs> so I'm just going to share my screen. Can everyone, Can everyone see that? Yes, yes. No, Katie, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Okay, can you hear okay. me now? What is there like, an, there echo? like an echo?
Okay, what about now? Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, I'm Katie Stevens. Um, I'll be talking about ghost nets of plastics hunting the Pacific um, and my work on them and how I got to this position. Next slide. Okay, so I studied biology in undergrad as well as environmental science, uh, which I liked being outdoors and on the water as a kid. So, uh, so it's right up my alley. I also got to study abroad in Copenhagen and studied renewable energy. And um, when I graduated, I wanted to work in wind energy, but um, can you click? I couldn't find a job in uh, biology or in wind energy. I ended up getting a serving job and a part-time unpaid internship, just kind of doing random tasks as well as social media about sustainability in general. Um, this is where I started learning about plastic pollution and getting really interested in it, um, but didn't really lead to anything. I got another serving job, a different summer internship, another part-time unpaid internship, um, it wasn't con uh, conservation, but I didn't feel like I really had like a solid path I was on. Next slide. Um, but I did, um, getting more into the plastic area, I looked up other um, organizations that were doing plastic research. So I did get to go on two plastic research expeditions uh, in Maine and Denmark. Next slide. Um, I also spent some time traveling. So the two pictures on the top are the Rosalia project, the expedition I did in Maine and the expedition in Denmark with By the Ocean We Unite. Um, I also spent some time traveling, which was really awesome, but I was like, what am I doing with my life? All my friends have jobs. Um, and then I got a seasonal position as a deckhand and environmental educator on the Schooner Sultana, which, um, again, was like kind of in the environmental field, but was seasonal. And um, I still kind of felt like I was wandering around, not really on a path. Next slide. Um, but I do just want to say, even if it seems like you're not on the right path, you're still gaining skills and experiences that will help you later. Like I got a bunch of boating skills from the jobs that I did. Um, and the connections that I made were really great. And the experience was helped me later on as you'll see in the next slide. Um, so after the Sooner Sultana job, I got a job at Four Ocean in Florida working on plastic cleanup. Um, I also was start, wanted to get more involved in just like all things ocean related. So I volunteered at the Loggerhead Marine Life Center, um, also working on plastic, um, plastic cleanups on the beach. I also volunteered with the Florida Manta Project and that was doing um, shoreline surveys or like off the coast along the shore surveys for manta rays along the coast of Florida. Next slide. Um, and both of those just gave me more um, boating experience as well as um, learn more about plastic. And then through um, connections at Four Ocean, I learned about the Hawaii Pacific University master's in marine science program. So I moved out here to Oahu. Um, while I was in school, I also got a job bartending on a sunset cruise. So that combined all these like the boating skills, the serving skills, as well as my desire to be out on the water. And I was lucky enough to have a graduate assistant position at the Center for Marine Debris Research where I work now. Next slide. So when I graduated from, um, that's fine, you can stay on this one. When I graduated from Hawaii Pacific University, um, I got a job at the Center for Marine Debris Research full-time. So now I'm the project coordinator. I work mainly on derelict fishing gear and the project we have now is focused on removal. So I work with local fishermen as well as volunteers, um, but I also get to work on other projects at CMDR like storage with Astrid, um, lots of different projects we have going on in the lab. And I really like what I'm doing now because I get to do something different every day. 
there's some field work, there's some lab work, there's some computer work. I get to work with a lot of different people. Um, next slide. So just to zoom out to the Hull Center for Marine Debris Research for a second, um, our goal here is a trash-free ocean. So we investigate all the different aspects of plastic from where it's coming from, where it's going, how it gets there, um, the impact on the environment and organisms and ways to reuse and um, recycle it. We use all different fields to study plastic from biology to engineering and economics and more. We look at all different sizes of plastic as well from nanoplastics that you can't see um, with your naked eye to microplastics and up to megaplastics, which is um, derelict fishing gear that I'm working on. Next slide, please. Um, just a little overview of some of the projects we have. Well, we look at plastic weathering and degradation. So Astrid's looking at that and we have other projects going on as well. We look at ingestion in different animals, microplastics in the environment, um, plastic polymers and what gets added into plastics, plastic recycling. We have a project looking into how to recycle plastic into asphalt. Um, we also work on method development because plastics are a relatively new area of study and many more. Next slide. So my um, project I'm working on deals with derelict fishing gear or DFG as we call it. You may have also heard it referred to as ghost gear or ghost nets. This refers to any lines, traps, um, nets, or other fishing gear that is abandoned, lost, or otherwise discarded at sea. Um, it's estimated that there's 1 million tons of derelict gear added to the ocean every year. And just one net alone can be the size of a football field. Um, and then in Hawaii specifically, over 100 tons of DFG wash ashore every year. And Somewhat maybe surprisingly, not all of this is, or not any of it is from Hawaiian fisheries. So it's all coming from um, fisheries outside of Hawaii. And then on the right is just some of the, <laughs> sorry, some of the fishing gear that we do get here. The uh, top picture is what we call a fad or a fish aggregating device. So it's a raft that floats on the surface and then has a tail hanging straight down and this serves to attract um, fish to it. And then on the middle right is a satellite buoy. So usually this is attached to one of those rafts. So fishermen can track it down and see um, where all the fish are. The green net is just one, um, just one piece of net. So they can be pretty big. And then on the bottom is uh, what we call a conglomerate, just a mess of tangled nets and lines all together. Next. Um, so Brittany and Astrid kind of talked about this, but Hawaii's location um, makes it so that all this stuff like washes up on our beaches. I don't know if it'll work, but the little ghosts represent little ghost nets and there was an animation that they would swirl around <laughs> in the currents. Um, but so this stuff is washing to Hawaii in the currents in the ocean, um, coming from the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and elsewhere. Next slide. Oh no, this animation doesn't work either. Um, there's a picture of a monk seal that has some net around it and a turtle. Um, so obviously entanglements are a huge problem. It can harm the growth of animals. It can um, impede their movement or their ability to come up to take a breath at the surface. Um, there's a picture of a net on a coral reef. Uh, nets can be really damaging to coral reefs. Um, they can break and smother and kill the coral. Um, but then another thing that we may not think about as much is entanglements of um, like boats and active fishing gear. So that's one of the problems we deal with in the project I'm working on. Since I work with fishermen, a lot of times they get these nets because they're wrapped around their props. Um, it can be dangerous because people then have to dive down to disentangle it. I had a captain tell me that one of the fishers almost drowned while he was trying to um, detangle the gear from their prop. I had another captain tell me they got a net wrapped around their prop and were stranded um, until someone could come and tow them in so that they lose their 
fishing time, it's dangerous to them, all kinds of problems. Next slide. Um, so we're working on a couple solutions to help with this problem. We have a project called Structure for Motion, which assesses the damage caused um, to coral reef by a net strike. We have a sourcing study that looks at the materials and the structure of different fishing gear. And we have a bounty project that pays flying fishermen to remove derelict fishing gear at sea. Next. So first, the structure for motion. We use photogrammetry to model coral reef in Kaneohe Bay in Oahu. Um, photogrammetry is the process of taking overlapping photos of a structure and then creating a 3D model. So um, the picture is uh, Kaneohe Bay, the red spots are net strikes, and then the yellow circle is um, a reef that has a high frequency of net strikes. So that is the reef we chose to get um, a baseline of the coral structure before a net strike using this photogrammetry. And then after we get a net that hits the reef, um, we can use the photos and the model to assess damage that has been done to the reef and then see how it recovers over time. Next slide. So on the left is the process of how we get the pictures. So basically you just swim back and forth. We had a 10 by 50 meter um, plot, I believe. You just swim back and forth, getting the overlapping photos of the whole area. On the right side is what the model produces. Um, so you can see the like real uh, reef with a net on it. And then below the green and the blue shows the depth of the reef. This was just a case study. We don't actually have yet a, um, a net strike where we have the before and after, um, which I guess might be a good thing because we haven't had a net strike in the last um, about a year. Um, but the goal is to have before and after, and then we can monitor the coral reef after the net strike. Next slide. Next was the sourcing study. We had 18 metric tons of derelict fishing gear that we moved from around the Hawaiian Islands and the North Pacific Gyre. We would get something that looks like this and then disentangle all of it and sort through it to get to something that looks like um, the pictures I have on the next slide. So we'd sort it all out into each different unique piece of gear, and then we take it into the lab. Next slide, please. And we'd look at the different materials, the structure of it. We have a database with over 70 different metrics that we looked at for each um, piece of gear. We wanted to figure out where it came from. Um, rarely someone have like writing or markings on them where we could trace back to a country or a manufacturer. And the goal of this is to um, engage with different groups to work towards solutions and reductions and possibly help um, inform policy change to work on solutions like extended producer responsibility. Next. So now my main project is the derelict fishing gear bounty project. We pay Hawaiian fishermen a bounty to remove derelict fishing gear from the ocean. The goal is to remove 100 metric tons of derelict fishing gear in the two years of the project. And hopefully this will prevent derelict fishing gear from getting near shore since they are removing it from out in the ocean. Um, so prevent it from getting near shore and harming the coral reef um, environments and some near shore organisms. And hopefully this provides an incentive to the fishermen to remove derelict fishing gear when they see it. So. So far, we've removed uh, 4.3 metric tons. Sorry. <laughs> um, this is uh, over 9,000 pounds. We've had 34 different like events, so, so different um, nets that we've brought in from 18 different fishermen or vessels. Next slide. And how does it work? So the fishermen, they'll be out at sea um, if they find a net, they call us and we go meet them at the pier to pick it up. So sometimes they can be a couple thousand pounds. Um, so it takes a lot of man effort and sometimes the little crane they have on the boat to move it into our truck. Next slide. We take it to our wonderful net shed. 
um, where we, uh, next slide, we weigh, measure it and take pictures. And next slide. And then what do we do with it? So after we weigh and measure it, we're not, thankfully for me, not sorting it out and doing the in-depth study of all the different pieces. So after we get the information we want, we dispose of it, but there's a couple of different things that happens um, when we dispose it. So we have a bunch of local artists who have taken some of our debris and made some really awesome um, pieces of artwork out of it. We have a project looking at making derelict fishing gear into asphalt and other infrastructure. And then um, there's a couple other groups who have taken it for research purposes, looking at shredding, recycling, cutting technologies, studying invasive algae. And we have a couple other groups who have taken it for other repurposing methods. Um, and then I just calculated this yesterday, but almost half of our um, the gear we've collected has been used for research art or other um, ways to be repurposed, which is really awesome. So um, yeah, thanks for listening. Um, and the next slide just has some, if you wanna follow our work at CMDR or connect with me, uh, there it is. Sorry for all the technical difficulties. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Amazing, we got there in the end. Nice work. Um, I know that we have a few questions and there's a, a couple for Astrid. So maybe Astrid, I can be moderator and ask you the questions and then you can kind of take over and ask um, any other questions. So uh, what one question we had at the beginning from Ruth was um, that what software did you use to generate the, the plastic patch map and um, which hub did you obtain the 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 MACE map from? Mm -hmm. The base yeah, map. So that's a, yeah, yeah, that's a really cool, uh, good question. So I, I worked with the Ocean Cleanup and they've just um, uh, developed this segmentation model. Um, and the idea is that they're, I think they're, they've developed an app um, for it so that um, it could be used by anyone. Um, I think it has been, it's been made. Um, I think it's like about to be published. Um, I think on their um, website. So it's. Uh, I think it's it's ready, but almost being published for everyone to use. So it should be coming out soon to be used. And I know they're like writing an article on, about it as well um, on how it can be used and everything. So it's it's coming. <laughs> uh, but it's very useful, uh, definitely if you're in this field and you need this. Um, this uh, this tool. Great, thank you. And if anyone has any other questions, just pop them in the Q and A, and then we'll hopefully get to them. There's another one for Astrid, um, and they say, "Nice talk. Is the sand composition and grain size on these beaches similar? So you did these three different sites, and do you think the depth of the plastics in the sand could be linked to the sand compositions if they're different at the different locations?" Yeah, um, so that's a really good question, which I'm trying to figure out too. Um, the sand is very different uh, visually um, on the three beaches. And that is one of my, I'm hoping for the next piece of field work in November that I'll uh, be collecting some data on the sand um, um, composition. But yeah, if you're in this field and you know a lot about sand, please reach out to me because I'm uh, I'm a chemist <laughs> and I'm still learning how beaches work and how they're composed. So yeah, if you're in this field, please reach out. Um, yeah, I'll write my email address on the on the chat. But yeah, I think I think it definitely has some impact on how it stores plastics and how plastics arrive. Right. And um, we have a question from Oriana. Maybe each one of you could uh, kind of answer sequentially. She's curious to know how you were able to link up with the CMDR and to do your research there. So I think you might have mentioned it in each of your your talks but yeah how did you get involved with the the research center in Hawaii and maybe like how beneficial has it been for you to to be under a place or part of a, 
a center that's really specializing in the in this cutting edge, edge research. Well, if I go first, but yeah, I did mention, um, I guess, in my slide, uh, in my presentation. Um, so yeah, I got in contact with Ocean Cleanup, and they reached out to me, and got me in contact with Sarah Jean, who was uh, uh, who is working at um, the Center of Marine Debris Research, um, and then I got in contact uh, with the other people working there, such as uh, Jennifer Lynch, and um, yeah, and then I think it's it's great to be part of the. Um, a center that really focuses on marine plastic pollution and in this region too, because I mean, I'm coming from Europe, I'm coming with a, a different um, scientific background. So um, I think we all learn from each other and I think you definitely need that for a scientific, like for a research project and especially for this plastic pollution problem, which really needs everyone from all fields, all regions and different perspectives. Um, to tackle this big problem. But yeah, I don't know if Brittany or in, um, Katie want to add anything to. Um, so I'll just say that CMDR and HPU are, um, Katie can probably answer this better, but they're pretty closely affiliated. CMDR is on um, one of the HPU campuses. So um, I, the first thing I did was get enrolled in HPU and I was discussing with my advisor on projects. And so when I decided to take on the microplastic project, automatically I was pretty much tied in with CMDR because everyone who knows things about microplastics are at CMDR. So um, although my advisor, um, he is pretty new in the microplastic field, but he is an oceanographer, which is um, a lot of the you know theoretical stuff that I'm thinking about for why convergence is happening. So he's not really that involved with CMDR, but because I'm working with microplastics, I am somewhat involved with CMDR. Um, but Katie definitely has a lot more involvement. Um, but yeah, I'll take it to you, Katie. Um, yeah, so I worked at uh, Four Ocean in Florida and they, sell bracelets that every month they um, support a different organization. So 4Ocean had partnered with the Center for Marine Debris Research, re research for a month. Um, so that's how I found out about CMDR. And since they are associated with Hawaii Pacific University, um, that's when I saw that HPU was accepting for this master's program. Um, so I applied to the master's program, but like was in contact with CMDR because I really wanted to work there. And I did do my um, graduate assistant work, which is just like nine hours a week we do while in school. So I did that at the Center for Marine Debris Research. And then um, I've been really lucky that the project I was working on needed a project coordinator. So when I graduated, they hired me. Um, and I'm just really appreciative for all of the different like things that happened that got me here because this was the kind of job I was looking for like when I first graduated from undergrad and like couldn't really find it um but this is like kind of my dream job and I'm like really happy that I've ended up here um yeah great thank you everyone and We've had a question because we have quite a uh, we have a global network of early career ocean professionals and quite a few of our members are located in Africa on the African continent. And so um, one person is asking if there are any projects um, that are based in Africa or with African countries that you know of or you're working in. And obviously, it seems like Hawaii is at the cutting edge of this research, but there's other regions that need support to, to kind of start doing this research as well. So is there any, any assistance or any opportunities you can you know of in terms of working with different um, regions, specifically Africa? I can't think of anything like now on the spot, but... Uh... Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, she did raise the issue of, yeah, it's, it might be difficult in Africa with the institutes um, not being there uh, or giving the opportunities. Um, 
I would um, really start uh, looking at the UN Ocean Decade and like the different um, regional nodes there because um, they often like post different opportunities and uh, I myself, I think I'm, I'm part of it. I keep getting emails about it and uh, also look at the ECOP um, website. I think there's like a, a section for opportunities. Um, uh, yeah, and then for different regions too. And I, um, because the UN Environment Program, they have their headquarters in Kenya, I would also look into um, what they offer and their opportunities. And they've just started a new, um, uh, what do you call like a department on marine pollution. Um, so that would be very useful to look at. And also they have the waste management uh, department. Um, as well as, you know, science divisions, um, communication divisions, uh, which all have some sort of a plastic uh, work in them now because it's such a big problem in all these fields. So I would definitely look into um, the UN Environment Programme and they usually try and, um, uh, yeah, favour people coming from that region as well because you have the knowledge of, you know, like the of the African continent and like, wherever you are. Um, so that would definitely be, I think, a valuable uh, knowledge. Um, but yeah, and then I, I mean, I'm a big, I, um, whenever I'm trying to find new opportunities or, um, yeah, possibilities, I email people. I uh, look up the people that I would want to work with or organizations that I want to work with and I would, um, reach out to them often you don't get a response but keep reaching out keep being stubborn um and keep networking I think that that's for me like that's definitely been um how I advanced in my career and getting uh, different like really exciting opportunities so um yeah keep bugging people <laughs> great thanks Astrid and I'd say if you're not signed up to the Ocean Decade Net network already if you go onto the oceandecade.org and you join the network you can then search uh, regionally for different projects that are happening so yeah there is a lot going on and that resource of the the network is really helpful as well as the ECOP network where we have a, uh, the group on the 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 ocean decade network as well so this forum is really helpful I've put the link in the chat I have a question actually because um it's interesting that you guys um, have these two angles with um, Katie working with fishing gear and then Brittany and Astrid really working in plastics. And um, Katie said that she'd been working with the fishermen. And I was just wondering if there'd been any advancement of the plastics industry kind of taking any responsibility or there's been any conversation <laughs> with what's going on with them being the producers of this waste. I just was interesting it would be interesting to know what how how this is advancing um i'll say that it's i think probably harder for microplastics to determine the source just because um really all you can get is polymer data and right now we know um, there might be someone from CMDR, maybe um, Jen Lynch that can answer better, but um, yeah, you can really just get polymer data. And we know that most plastics that are in Hawaii are polyethylene, but that's, I think, pretty much the, um, the most that we know. We can't really say where it's from. Um, we just know that most polymers that arrive here are polyethylene. There, yeah, the only like real identification you could get and like maybe try like sort um, do the source tracking is if um, you have like whole pieces and you can see like, oh, this was made in or um, different languages. So you could like track from which country is coming from. Um, but even then that's difficult because like, was it, yeah, uh, was it produced there or, used somewhere else and um was it dropped from like a ship or and so on but that's um uh, one way of like tracking where it's from but also yeah like Brittany was saying it's for fragmented pieces of plastic it's it's really difficult 
to know where it's from. Like the, we can only know like the main like polymer um, of what it is. And like everyone makes <laughs> polyethylene and polypropylene who's in the plastic industry. So yeah, we can't um, pinpoint. <laughs> Sorry, are you done? Um, for Dara Lake Fishing Gear, um, that was kind of the aim of our sourcing study was to try and figure out maybe like the manufacturers or where the gear is coming from so that we could work upstream and try and reduce the amount of gear that's ending up in the ocean. Um, so like extended producer responsibility, trying to work with like manufacturers or the users of the product so they can have some part in like the removal of it not just leaving it out there um and then on like very rare occasions there is some writing like um either on like floats that we find or like in little pieces of line twisted into the line that says like the manufacturer or the country or the country um but that is rare but something that um don't quote me on this but i've heard um talked about is like having manufacturers have like tags or have their name on their gears because they wouldn't like it if like people keep finding this one piece of gear from um this certain manufacturer always like wrapped around monk seals or whatever the public will get very unhappy with that and hopefully the company would want to like do something to reduce the amount of their gear that's ending up in the ocean so um that was part of the goal of our study and we're um working we're still working on um that and hopefully the information we provide can help with like um, with all of that upstream like reducing the amount that ends up in the ocean in the first place. Yeah great and I, I think it will hopefully provide a, a really good example to people in the plastic or at least the companies in the plastic industry that this extended responsibility if um, their products are ending up in the ocean yeah there's a way a around it and moving towards the circular economy is definitely something we can all be supporting and um I don't think we have any more questions and we have only like five minutes left so I just wanted to uh finish up with a question about kind of the time frame so we have the decade of ocean science it's coming to an end in 2030 so what are your what are your plans for these coming years that are quite critical in in this research area so we've done a, a we've learned a lot about plastic pollution about um it ending up in these places like Hawaii because of the the strong currents so what's the next step and I think what's cool Astrid is that you're working with lots of different organizations really on this global scale and then Brittany and Katie you're, you're really working in Hawaii as this kind of hub so what's the the next stage and what do you kind of envision for this area of research to to kind of leave, leave us with a hopeful message as well for our environment and for the ocean that we we love Um, yeah, so if I start, I mean, I'm working then like with lots of different organizations and being part of like different groups like this. Um, I'm really motivated uh, by seeing like the, the other people's motivation and enthusiasm and like trying to really understand the problem and trying to find solutions. So that's, um, yeah, really like people working in this field and I've been able to connect with like it's really um it's really nice to see and it gives me hope and uh, just seeing like how engaged people are and really trying to find new solutions and like it's impressive to see the like the novelty and the like really cool uh, new ideas and projects um going on so um my project will uh finish in 2025 but I'm definitely gonna stay I want to stay in this plastic pollution field and hopefully in the Pacific as well because I think there's so much to be done and there's so many um interesting projects um here too and interesting like people to work with so I'm yeah it definitely working with the people makes me uh hopeful for ending it uh, ending the plastic pollution soon <laughs> Um, I was just going to say, I think that continuing to educate 
and work and outreach is really critical. So that might be something that I look into career-wise once I'm done with my master's degree. Um, because there's a lot of people, even um, some family friends back in California, when I try to explain what my re research in, they're like, so what are microplastics? I'm like, oh yeah, some people actually don't know this is a problem. So even in California, you people who have been, you know, to the beach, they don't know a lot about marine debris. So I think that is um, probably the next, one of the next big things to focus on. And for my job specifically, um, this project I'm working on, our goal is to remove 100 tons of derelict fishing gear over um, two years. So um, that will be good. And we're just at the beginning, so that will pick up and we'll remove more. We also just got a $3 million grant to scale our project from just Oahu to all of the Hawaiian islands, the main Hawaiian islands. Um, so that will enable us to remove and recycle a lot more derelict fishing gear. And then kind of like Astrid said, just like the world as a whole, seeing the amount of people like researching and working on plastic cleanup and um, repurposing and recycling and all that makes me hopeful that we will um, maybe not solve, but like are working to reducing this problem. Um, so that's what makes me hopeful for the coming years. Great. And we definitely need, we need hope and we need all hands on deck. So amazing. Thank you so much for joining us this evening and for sharing all the hard work you've been doing. We wish you so much good fortune in, in continuing with your research and for getting more grants and being able to, to, to roll out these projects. And um, yeah, we, we will be sharing this recording um, and so please stay in touch and find the ECOT program at our website, which is www.ecotdecade.org. And all our speakers have also reached out and said you can, you can contact them and be in touch as well. So let's definitely keep this conversation going. And um, I will say thank you. And if you want to say any last, last words, Astrid, I'll, I'll let you you're finished and you could maybe advertise your next webinar that's happening as well in September. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you again for inviting us to um, speak at this webinar, um, which was, again, like I, I think is great to uh, get connected with other people and um, just sharing the research. Um, and yeah, so there'll be another webinar um, organized by Oriana, who's here. <laughs> so maybe she has a link to, um, I can get it quickly. Um, but yeah, it's happening on the 15th of September. Um, uh, you have it, Oriana. She's beat you to it. She's done it. Oh, she got it. Okay, good. Thanks, <laughs> Oriana. There it is. Yeah, so you can register for that one. So, um, yeah, I'll present uh, a bit more on storage there. Uh, and there's also other um, uh, participants. So, yeah, um, I would register that one. And then, yeah. <laughs> Thank you again, and uh, and yeah, if you have any more questions, you can always reach me at the email address I shared in the group chat. I'm the same with Brittany and Katie. Okay. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Brittany. Thanks, Katie, and thanks, Astrid, and thanks everyone for coming. We we'll say good evening or good morning <laughs> in your case. Thank you. Take care. Yeah, Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.